They, their worst case, and I call it their scorched earth scenario, was they were factoring in 30% house prices here in Australia. Won't hold you to it, but sort of do you share in that worst case scenario or, or from your experience for both of you, where do you see the housing market heading over the next 12 months? Hi everyone, um, my name is uh, Tony Catt, Director of Catapult Wealth. Um, today here with uh, a couple of special guests where we're talking today about residential property. Um, the residential property for most Australians is always on the agenda in terms of investment vehicles and and at the moment it's been probably more on the agenda due to the COVID situation and everyone's um, looking saying is it an opportunity, is it a threat, um, you know, how do, we, how do we look at this current situation and, and so I think broadly um, this issue is not just related to COVID. I think a lot of people want to know more about investing in residential property in a general sense. And so we thought we'd drag in a couple of experts uh, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, uh, Adam, can you uh, tell me a bit about yourself and your background? Hey, Tony, thanks for having me along. Uh, I'm um, a Managing Director of Prosper Property Advisory. Um, so we're a part of the uh, Aspire Property Advisor Network. And we've also got Nick Menz, the acquisitions uh, director from the property uh, Aspire Property uh, Network as well. So I help people uh, from all walks of life looking to buy investment property. Mm -hmm. So whether it's their first investment property, right through to seasoned property investors. I'm a qualified property investment advisor, so a QPIA, mm -hmm. um, accredited with the Property Investment Professionals Australia. Um, there's, I think, about just under 100, well, as of February this year, there's 100 QPIAs registered and active in Australia. Right. and five in Adelaide. So what that means um, with being a QPIA and part of the uh, Aspire network is we're working to a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. um, we are licensed and experienced property investment professionals. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the bigger kickers is we carry professional indemnity insurance, mm -hmm. which is specific to property investment advice. Right. So I guess us compared to some of the other people, we've got some uh, fair bit of skin in the game with the advice we give with property. So we um, work with a borderless approach to property. Mm -hmm. We've got a team, or Nick's team, um, who uh, oversee the acquisition of property Australia-wide, looking for opportunities, um, areas where we're seeing good growth, mm -hmm. capital growth potential. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a few acquisitions metrics, which I could let Nick talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, we put a property investment plan together with a client, um, how that will look, how many properties they need to buy, mm -hmm. what locations, mm -hmm. whether they're looking for a mixture of properties that need to be uh, with capital growth, higher yielding properties, mm -hmm. and then help them execute that plan and buy those properties. Great. So, yeah. um, Nick, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and what you do with the group? Uh, sure, sure, Tony. Um, so, look, I'm the National Acquisitions Director for the Aspire Property Advisor Network. So I deal with builders and developers across Australia, uh, conduct due diligence on them as the key uh, stakeholders. Uh, then look at areas and property types uh, right across Australia. We put them through a due diligence process. Uh, once we have ascertained their, uh, essentially their ratings uh, and that we're comfortable with the, the property type, uh, then we will list it on our online portal, which our property investment advisors then tap into uh, and they will then work through a process with the client. So on the portal it has a lot of the due diligence um, that we put the properties through uh, and it gives the investor a, a position to start from to do their own independent research into um, the property attributes. Yeah, fantastic. The, the first question I have off the bat is a lot of uh, clients, you know, I guess always have questions around property type. So whether it be apartments, townhouses, uh, established dwellings, can you talk to me a bit how you approach that and, and what um, what particular work you do behind the scenes on that front? Okay, so one of the first things I look at with a client is what's the end game with property? Mm -hmm. What are they actually trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we'll take a bit of the emotion out of it. Let's get to are they trying to replace income with property, retire early? Is it something that's going to bolster their retirement funds, um, build up some equity that maybe children can draw upon to get them started in the market further down the track? Um, and we'll tie that in with the types of properties that they need to buy. Um, personally, I tend to avoid um, apartments. Mm -hmm. I just uh, don't see a huge amount of capital growth in apartments. So, you know, unless you've got something that's um, an apartment in a fairly boutique location that's got some really redeeming features, but they tend to be fairly few and far between. 
Um, my preference would be um, house and land mm -hmm. um, or a, a quality townhouse in a good area. So we'll look at um, uh, the different property types and sometimes it actually means the client having to go through the construction process of building the property to get the right outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not talking property developers here. We're talking property investors. Mm -hmm. So a longer term focus. So with even building um, a property to get the right investment property, I'll say to my clients is six, maybe nine months you know, on the sideline while that's being built. Yep. Is that worthwhile in a 20 year plan to achieve a better result longer mm -hmm. term? So, and and is that with that construction process, um, the pros and cons? What what I guess people are going to say? What can go wrong? What you know? What yep. what are the things that go right? So, uh, what what are the pros and cons of that? Yeah. So I guess um, the construction process we've pro we've got the luxury of working as a network. So mm -hmm. we would go to a builder. Nick obviously his team do the due diligence on the build. Mm -hmm. They have a pre prepared package that we know you know um, appeals to a broad audience. Mm -hmm. Through that, we'll actually micromanage that build process and the builder mm -hmm. through the actual process. So a lot of people say, oh, it's going to cost me more to build. Yep. That's not quite right. Mm -hmm. First of all, with stamp duty, um, if you, with a, say a house and land package, you settle on the land first, mm -hmm. the first part of the purchase, then you go through that construction process. So by settling on the land, you only pay stamp duty on the land and what's there at the time. Yeah. Yep. So that can be a significant saving on stamp duty. You do have to make progress payments as your um, mm -hmm. build goes through and construction um, completes. However, it tends to be a fairly cost-neutral exercise. So mm -hmm. in most cases, it's not actually costing you anything more to build. Mm -hmm. What it does is it can give you a more rentable property, mm -hmm. appeal to a broader market. Mm -hmm. um, you can then uh, attract you know, your more ideal tenants, so mm -hmm. families, um, the like. Uh, look at bathrooms, you know, a lot of places that are a townhouse or apartment may not actually have a proper bathroom with a bath. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to attract a family tenant, mm -hmm. you want a bath for your children. Mm, absolutely. Just little things like that. Some yep. yard space, yep. that sort of thing. Do you, um, looking at different, you said you're borderless, a borderless approach, which I, I do appreciate. And I assume by borderless, you mean within Australia. What are the things you look at in terms of demographics or the different parameters that make um, certain areas better than others? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the things, or some of the key metrics we look at, um, this is what Nick does before a property is even actually um, made available for me to look at mm. with a client. Uh, we have to have at least uh, 100,000, sorry, 100,000 head of population yep. within a 20 kilometre radius. Yep. So that provides you with a rental pool. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I look at this as being a, um, a business that you're buying. It's a property, but we treat it like a business. If something goes wrong further down the track, you also need that resale market as mm. well. Uh, don't look at... Um, or avoid single industry towns, so mining mm -hmm. towns and defence towns. Mm -hmm. We've all heard the stories of how great it is to invest mm -hmm. in a mining town. Mm -hmm. you know, during the boom times, you're getting great rental yields, mm -hmm. capital growth, like that. When the mine packs up or that battalion of soldiers pack up and leave, you're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. A property can hardly rent and you can't sell. So mm -hmm. we certainly want to protect our clients from that sort of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, other things like major infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. um, employment zones, mm -hmm local amenities, just things that make an area more livable, mm -hmm. want people to want to live in, that's what's going to attract tenants. Yeah, We go down as far as the demographics of who lives in the area, what are their incomes, what are the employment types. My preference is always where we can get medical or teachers yep. because we know whatever's going on in the economy, hospitals always have their doors open and so do schools. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're in a pretty... Um, different <laughs> environment with COVID, mm. Mm. but again, hospitals are still open and we're still seeing schools operating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, percentage of rental properties is another thing. Uh, I see, you know, on social media, I see a lot of these groups marketing these areas. Some of them have got upwards of 70% rental properties in that area. Mm. So what that does is it means if you lose a tenant mm. and you need to attract a tenant fairly quickly, you know, you may need to reduce your rent. The house next door being a rental property, that Competing. does the same. Yeah. The floor rental rate across that suburb drops. And as an investor, that's not what you want. You no. don't want to be competing like seagulls on a chip over tenants. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's it's a good background to have. And I'm certainly um, familiar with some of those situations you mentioned. It's um, just jumping around a little bit. One of the things that I believe is, I, I guess, in, in every particular, I know financial planning went through a lot of scepticism with financial planners and commissions and bias and products and everything like that, your industry with property developers and, and people worried about who's getting a cut out of the cake, I, I think would come up, I'm, I'm sure, in your field a lot. Um, do you have uh, some comments to make around that and how that's addressed to the organisation? Yeah, 100%. And Nick might want to talk to this as well. Um, 
the Aspire network was set up around that removing that conflict of interest because mm. you know there are um, you know commissions that do or can change hands with some people between mm. the developer incentive programs and that to push stock over or push sales of their properties over others. Mm -hmm. um, we've got codes of conduct and we ha that prevent that. Mm -hmm. And I actually have no direct dealing with the vendor, okay. with the developer. Yep. So Nick, is there anything you can add on that? Yes. Well, the portal that we operate uh, operates as that marketplace. So I'm dealing uh, below the line with the builders and developers to bring properties there. Adam's then dealing with uh, the clients and any professional uh, service partners uh, above the line. Uh, that marketplace is the meeting. So everything is disclosed uh, to a client when they do make a purchasing decision so they can see uh, what what the compensation on the table for Adam and other advisors are. Mm -hmm. um, so we do try and keep it all very above board and transparent. Great. And one thing I'll add there as well with how we get paid uh, and the transparency there. So we have uh, what we call on-market properties mm -hmm. where the local Ray White agent may have that same property for sale. Mm -hmm. If they were to sell the um, that property, mm -hmm. they'd receive the commission from the seller. As if one of our clients was to purchase that property, if it had met um, you know, their requirements, we would get paid that to commission. Okay. A lot of developers will actually come to a group like ours because we're a network of advisors across Australia. Mm -hmm. We have a number of qualified uh, buyers ready to, to invest at any time. So a lot of developers will make that a quicker process of selling their stock by going through a group like ours. Yep. No, great. Um, changing gears again, with the new house, um, you mentioned before about construction and we get into a new house. I understand there's other depreciation benefits also of the new house. Do you want to just explain how that works? Yeah, definitely. There's two types of depreciation which we look at. One is actually on the bricks and mortar of the property itself, mm -hmm. and the other is on the fixtures and fittings inside the property. Mm. To claim the um, depreciation on the actual building itself, it's got to be less than 40 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the last budget that was passed down, they made changes with how depreciation is claimed, and they've said that only brand new fixtures and fittings can be uh, depreciated. Mm -hmm. What was happening beforehand, a house was being bought, used as an investment property. Mm -hmm. Investors were claiming depreciation on all the fixtures and fittings, selling that property. Mm -hmm. The next buyer was then coming and reclaiming all mm -hmm. the depreciation on that. Mm -hmm. So um, so they've moved to a model where everything has to be brand new to claim depreciation. Yep. So if you've got an existing house, you put a new kitchen in, you can then claim depreciation on that brand new kitchen. Yep. Um, for our clients, we just find it easy to work in that brand new space. Mm -hmm. Our clients are busy people generally. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to be going doing the repairs and looking after that sort of thing. Um, so by buying brand new again, you're getting that depreciation on top, which can, you know, can be somewhere anywhere between eight to 10, 11, $12,000 of extra tax credits. Not all goes back in your pocket, but a tax credit so you can claim each financial year. Great. So yeah, that makes sense. And just on the brand new as well. I mean, look, the properties are more appealing to tenants Yeah. when they're brand new, everything's new, shiny. It's just easy to, uh, you know, everything operates yep. as an investor. You're not worried about the roof you know, being Hopefully. replaced, <laughs> fingers crossed, with our hail that we've had in the last 24 hours. Um, you know, major ticket items like that are covered under the builder's warranty. And even after a couple of years, if things, you know, if your you know, air conditioner packs in or the yeah. dishwasher dies, there's going to be replacement parts available. So you're not having to, uh, you know, replace wholesale items within the property. Yeah, great. Do you then, in a post-sale environment with the rental property, um, do you have people you refer, do you handle the rental side of that uh, cycle yourselves? Do you refer it out? How how's that that handled with your organisation? Yeah, so we keep everything at an arm's length just to keep some um, purity in the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, what we do have is a panel of providers in that scope. Mm -hmm. So we've got a um, a team, a concierge team. Mm -hmm. um, as the pro a property is ready to be handed over, the concierge team step in and talk to the investor. Mm -hmm. There's a few key areas there. So they will coordinate building inspections. Mm -hmm. Building inspector will go through, do an inspection on everything inside the property, mm -hmm. make sure that it's up to the building code. They'll prepare a report for anything that's not. Um, quite often there's you know small little things like paint overlays or grout missing from tiles in small sections and you know little bumps and things around the property. We'll then get that uh, inspection report back to the builder. The builder then corrects all, the, all of those um, defects. The building inspector will then go back through and sign all that off. So we know the build quality is there. We get a depreciation schedule arranged, mm -hmm. and again, the client pays for these, but our team coordinates the services. Um, as part with the depreciation schedule, that sets out over the next 40 years every little item that can be claimed on depreciation. So we know we've got the tax side of it worked out there, and accountants love that. <laughs> um, we'll also, uh, if the client doesn't have insurance, we can introduce them to an insurance broker 
to do a full review on their insurance to make sure they're getting the right insurance. And insurance is a tricky one at the moment with COVID and uh, rental vacancies. Some of the policy providers pulled out early on that. So yeah. I, I can't stress enough how important it is to get the right advice with insurance, like any part of the whole of the process, but that seems to be one where people will just shop around for the cheapest. Next part of the process is property management. So we need somebody to protect our investment. Mm -hmm. um, again, so we've got relationships right around Australia with quality rental managers mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, they understand rental management properly. They're running good businesses and we're happy to refer our clients on because right. we know they're getting looked after. Great. So. Yeah, no, that's great. It, it's often a concern if you clients say, well, we want to buy a house in, in Victoria or in Melbourne, for example, in suburbs over there at, at, where they identify higher growth opportunities or things like that. There's always that tyranny of distance issue where they go, well, can I look after it? Am I going to be on top of it? Um, yeah. Is it a problem that I, I live in Adelaide when I'm trying to look after a house in Melbourne? Yeah, and this is where our portal really is. It's worth its weight in gold. Mm. So the online property portal where people get the secure login. Mm. So right at the beginning when we're selecting properties, we'll provide people with a selection of properties, show them all the research, due diligence, all the information about the property to help them make the decision. Mm. When they've made the decision, um, you know, if they're building a property, all of the construction photos are uploaded to the portal so they can actually see it being built. Yep. They don't even have to go and visit it. Yeah. Then the handover of the property is all coordinated. Everything's, um, you know, co uh, we call the portal the one source of the truth. Everything's recorded on there. They can log into the property portal online from their lounge room, their office, practically buy a property, not get their hands dirty even signing a contract because everything's electronic these yeah. days. Yep. Yeah, and then they can actually see the property being built, handed over, and all they do is just collect the uh, the rent. Great. I get, I'd say probably 80, maybe 85% of my clients, maybe 90%. I've never even visited their rental property. So at one stage I had, majority of my clients were in Sydney and Melbourne. They were buying in Melbourne, um, Adelaide, or predominantly in the Brisbane sort of southeast Queensland market. I'd get a phone call two years later going, oh, wow, I understand why you recommended this property now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Nick, this may be a question for you. Um, tell me if it's not. Doing due diligence on the developers, the underlying developers, can you talk me just briefly through how you look for the the underlying developer and and, and how you, you choose one from the other? Yeah, sure. Look, um, what I look for is essentially their track record their reputation and understanding of the product that they've brought to market uh, beforehand. So I'll do a lot of due diligence, um, run background checks from the comfort of my, my desk and my computer. Uh, but then uh, I like to get out on the ground, actually set, set foot on the ground, uh, see what it is that they're producing this time round, but also then walk through some of their historical projects. So mm. whether that is a townhouse project or a land estate, mm. uh, you get a bit of a feel for what their um, their pride in their end product is. Mm. Uh, so not just how it looks at the time that they're handing it over, mm. uh, but how it's going to essentially stand the test of time and how it's going to look a few years down the track. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's great. It's um, do you, do you have to look beyond just the the actual build? Do you have to look at their underlying finances and their ability to? To see projects through, is that is that any is there consideration with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, we've we've all read the newspaper about builders going bust mm -hmm. and uh, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. Um, so I do prefer dealing with those where I know uh, a bit more about the circumstance of the directors. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer dealing with uh, um, well, we tend to deal with a lot of the smaller to medium sized developers. Uh, where you have a bit of an understanding of how they run their own business mm. and you know that they are essentially the key decision makers that's mm. going to influence the outcome of their product. Mm. Do you, have you, I mean, in terms of size of development, I might just touch on that for a moment, is that there's, you see them, I don't know, are they 20 houses, five houses, some of these developments, 100 houses. What, what, do you have any preference or do you just look at all shapes and sizes? It, um, the, the end product is really dictated by the client's investment strategy. Mm. So if you are looking at a, a house and land area, for instance, uh, the run-of-the-mill uh, end product for a house and land area tends to be that four-bed, two-bath, two-living area, double-car garage type property. Mm -hmm. um, but there is definitely a niche market for smaller products in those same areas. Mm. Now, the reason for that is you might have family coming to live with uh, 
well, yeah, perhaps a different generation coming to live with you down the track. Uh, might have kids as your family's growing that you know, perhaps want to be in the same area or perhaps give them a separate wing of the house. Uh, or you might have family separations where perhaps the partner that's moving out of the family home wants to stay within the area to have uh, easy access to be part of the kids' lives. So mm. they'll look for something smaller in that same area. Mm. So it's really just understanding, I guess, uh, what's available in the area right now and what that future supply is likely to look like. Mm. In terms of process, in terms of areas you look at, and 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 I don't know how much you, 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 I'm assuming it's on your website anyway. In terms of where you're seeing good areas and and, and opportunities at the moment. Um, before I get touch on that, do you do you have clients that Adam come to you with a specific area in mind and go, can you find something in the west of Adelaide, or how how do how do these sort of things come about, and how do you sort of talk to clients about it? Um, I would say 95% of my clients come to me saying, you know, I ask about, you know, what have you done so far in terms of your, you mm. know, research, um, investment wise, and, oh, I want to buy a house in this suburb. Mm. Generally, it tends to be an emotional decision yes. on a suburb right near theirs where they know they might drive past and look at that and go, oh, that'd be a good investment property. Mm. So, so we have to drill down into that and say, okay, why do you think that's a good investment property? What's around it? What are the, you know, the, um, the statewide factors? What are some of the influences that are... You know, got to. What are you looking to get out of it mm. at the end as well? Mm. So, it, quite often I have somebody coming to me saying, you know, I want to buy in the, you know, in a suburbs of Melbourne. Mm-hmm. They end up buying in Brisbane, mm-hmm. or somebody looking t- to buy in Adelaide. They might buy in Melbourne. Mm. It really gets down to that strategy overall. So, so again, it's um, uh, you know, just I think it's removing the emotion. Mm-hmm. I think, like we said before, you know, you, you might recommend stocks that people don't mm. understand. Mm. Here's why you give them the, the research why they should make that decision on mm-hmm. buying that stock or share. Mm. We'll do the same with the property. So, mm. you know, we look at um, you know, some of the growth regions at the moment, southeast Queensland, mm. the Sunshine Coast. You know, mm. we've had some investors up there do really well. Melbourne, they've done exceptionally well. Um, you know, so when we get clients that have got an expectation of a property performing like this, you know, the capital growth growing like that, mm. but they don't want to budge from their own suburb, No, we can't manufacture that. No. So yeah. it, it's really tricky. So I guess that sometimes people have got to understand that, you know, maybe they need to look further afield. Yeah. Um, there's also land tax implications. Uh, there's some changes to land tax recently in South Australia, which mm-hmm. people are starting to understand. Well, if I put pull all my properties in South Australia, you know, commercial and residential, I'm going to be in for a lot of pain. Mm. And some of the um, the trust structures which they'd previously used, which helped uh, get around the land tax, doesn't anymore. They've been unwound, as you know, yeah. and some people are in a world of pain. Yeah. So we're starting to see people become a lot smarter with how they invest. I'm noticing it more with Adelaide people there. Uh, and I think it's the way society's going now. We're, we're having this conversation. Nick's up in the Gold Coast. Yep. We're on video. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're recommending something, people can actually do their own research and yep. get online and, and look at a lot of this stuff now. So it makes the decision a bit easier. Agreed. Um, yeah, the, the, the emotional thing I think I connect with is that a lot of people are, because because of, where, as you say, where they grew up or everyone has their own bias, I suppose, and, and that's why you introduce some professionals to remove the, the, the bias or the emotion side of it, which is, which is great to hear. Um, the, does, how much does the financial constraints, I mean, I assume there's $300,000, $400,000 properties, is there $800,000 properties on those lists? Um, how far and wide do the financial um, constraints go? Uh, look, we, we get some properties on um, in you know the high 200s, mm-hmm. Uh, right up to we've had someone I think for 1.3 million yep. previously, you know, and that really depends. The luxury I've got is if a client comes to me with some really specific needs and it's not on our portal or on our stock list at the time, mm-hmm. um, it's a quick phone call and email to Nick saying, Nick, mm. here's the brief, here's what we need you to do. Mm. Um, can your team find me exactly this? And we do that quite often. Yeah, so, no, that's great. And what that allows us to do is, you know, if maybe somebody has got a slightly higher budget. And they're looking for that long-term capital growth. We can then maybe go find something a bit more bespoke. Mm. Um, you know, it might even be managing a subdivision. Mm. It might be something like that. Mm. It's a little bit um, outside the square from your average investment. Yep. No, and it's good to know that there's some some flexibility around that. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, people, um, you know, they, they read the papers, they hear the news. Oh, these are growth suburbs, and I suppose in Adelaide here, we've heard a lot about the growth in Mount Barker and and places like that. Just because, it, I, I guess, I, I want to—is it a myth or is it the truth? Where just because it's a, a summer a growth, an area like Mount Barker is growing um, quite exponentially in terms of population size, doesn't mean that it's great for property investment. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to just tackle that for a minute. Yeah. 
I guess there's a couple of words here. There's growth versus spread. Yeah. So if we've got an area like the northern suburbs of Adelaide, Mount Barker to an extent as well can have a bit of spread. Yep. Uh, where you see prices dilute. Yes. So, you know, if we're into the suburbs, the western suburbs, for example, where there's no more land, we can't build out into the beach, mm-hmm. we're locked in, we're, we're landlocked, mm. that helps drive a bit of capital yes. growth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we do see in some of the areas like Mount Barker, uh, we see some good uh, yields. Yeah, okay. So it's a bit of manufactured growth as well. As some stages of the um, developments are released, land values tend to go up. Yep. So that can help manufacture some growth in there as well. Mm. So in areas like that, Mount Barker to an extent, uh, I've seen the um, the plans for Mount Barker and what's been approved. Mm-hmm. Uh, my comfort over Mount Barker is probably better than some of the northern and southern regions. Yeah. Just because purely uh, north, you've got that really big spread of land. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I've got some questions here that have been posed by clients, but before I before I um, move on to that, do you find yourself um, uh, finding properties in any regional areas around Australia? I mean, like I know we talk about um, Brisbane and Melbourne in terms of suburbia and even, I suppose, Mount Barker is nearly semi-regional these days. But, I mean, towns like Ballarat or, you know, is, are you finding yourself, ex- and do you look in those areas uh, at, at any potential opportunities? Yeah, hundred percent. So we've had um, clients looking in uh, buying in Bendigo. Yep. Um, again, we get we need to get back to the basics of what's in the area. Does the population support it? Do we have multiple industries in there to support um, employment in the area? Yep. To attract tenants into the area to start with. Yep. So that's they're the key metrics. If we're looking at you know again your small little um, towns, we probably would avoid those. Yeah. Um, yep. Anything a bit speculative, we'll stay. And I think um, Wyal has been a you know a pretty good example of that. We had invest, investment groups really plugging uh, Wyala years ago, mm. um, and a lot of investors did their dough. Mm. So, mm. you know, all banked on lead production. Yep. Uh, hang on, that's a poor period there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's still production yeah. going ahead. Um, all right, it's been thrown a lifeline now, mm. but it's still a little bit shaky. Yeah, absolutely. So, it can go pear shaped. Yeah. So, I guess de risking or taking a bit of a risk out of it. Yep. Uh, the Sunshine Coast is a really good example of that. They've got a really strong strategy there to increase the population, mm-hmm. but that's been followed by good infrastructure spend, mm. light rail going in, mm. upgrade of the airport. So uh, the CBD got upgraded recently. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing some really planned um, growth in those areas, which will support the uh, population growth and capital growth. Great. Uh, so just moving then to some of the questions we've um, uh, been put forward, and, and feel free to just refuse to answer any of these if you feel <laughs> uncomfortable, but... You know, obviously, we we talked a bit about Adelaide and, and a lot of clients like investing uh, here in South Australia. Do you have any view of the Adelaide market at the moment and, and perhaps where some growth suburbs are? My preference at the moment for growth in Adelaide would be the northwest pocket. Mm-hmm. So I think the um, shipbuilding defence contracts, um, the magnitude of that is going to indri- that's going to drive um, a population of people that might be a bit transient. We'll have a lot of workers coming in, people that will need property. Uh, may not be able to buy or may just choose to rent. Yeah. So I think that sort of area around through so there. Semaphore. Semaphore, Port Adelaide. Uh, down through the peninsula, yeah. the Fever Peninsula. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so that would be my preference. Port Adelaide, um, the jury's still out on Port Adelaide for me yeah. personally. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> we've seen it start, fail, start, fail, start, yeah. fail so many times. Yeah. Whether this time it's got the legs to get up, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Great. Um, no, I appreciate that. In in terms of then in, in South Australia, do you have a benchmark you work off of when you're talking to clients about uh, benchmark yields or um, prices at the moment in terms of how that's that's calculated and what you look for? Um, uh, how I'll answer that, again, we look, when I look at um, getting the best result for my clients. So when we do some financial modelling on an investment, mm-hmm. so we look at you know the incomes versus all the um, income from the property as well, yep. tax benefits and all the costs. Uh, that um, w- when we look at that, we'll also factor in um, a rough projected capital growth. Yes. Now we're pretty strict on our capital growth. Our licensing makes sure that we're not making um, false claims mm. and ridiculous amounts. But when I do compare Adelaide to some of the other states in long term mm. capital growth, I will peel that back to a lower amount. Okay. Yep, no, that's diplomatic fair. Aunt, diplomatic yeah, no, thank you. And, appreciate that. Hey, I've grown up in Adelaide. I love Adelaide. Yeah. I've got property in Adelaide myself. Yeah. Um, however, I just think there's probably as an investor, purely as an in, my, with my investment hat on, yeah. there are probably better options elsewhere. Um, Nick, I might pose this question to you: just expectations around uh, supply of new properties to the market in the next six to twelve months ahead. Is is COVID or the marketplace shifting at all in terms of uh, supply and demand? 
Uh, not really. Um, when the restrictions first came into place, what was it, six six long weeks ago, <laughs> uh, we did see everyone shifting to, I guess, what we consider the new normal. Uh, a lot of people being forced to work from home, kids not allowed to go to school. So I guess that contracted uh, it in the short term. Uh, from there, as we've all found our feet, businesses have found new ways to move ahead. Uh, I think that underlying demand still there and the desire to either purchase uh, as a home or as an investment is definitely still there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we are seeing the markets definitely still moving on quite strongly. Uh, in terms of the rental sides, uh, property managers have had to stop doing uh, group open inspections. Uh, so what we've seen a lot of them do is then move to um, virtual inspections then the next step being a personal um, inspection of the property. So that's been working quite well. I guess it's sort of taking people back to working one-on-one with a client, understanding what they want, and then uh, doing their best to fill that need. Mm. So I think I think looking forward, so I think it's still, uh, you know, there's still a lot of demand from both the tenancy side and from the purchasing property side. And on the supply side, do you see any developers pulling their, their reins in a little bit or you see it business as usual? I think the uh, the contraction side will definitely flow through in due course. I think banks uh, have perhaps changed their funding and their positions for where they're going to be comfortable in lending money to developers. Mm. Uh, so I think some of those smaller developers that were acquiring higher level of finance are either going to struggle to get finance or they're going to be paying a higher rate uh, to attract that. Mm. So I think we will find that the supply um, will diminish over the next 6 to 12 to perhaps even 18 months. Mm. Yep, yeah, no, fair call. I think just on that as well, yeah. I think we're going to start to see you know, there's a lot more alternative funding pop up in the market as yeah. well. Yeah. So there'll be a lot outside of, of the banks. Yeah, outside yep. of the banks, definitely. Yeah, already seeing a bit of that now. Um, the, the, I saw in NAB's um uh, and Westpac's, in particular, national banks result the other day where they wrote down I think two billion dollars. They their worst case, and I call it their scorched earth scenario, was they were factoring in thirty percent house prices here in Australia. Uh, I won't hold you to it, but sort of do you share in that worst case scenario or or from your experience for both of you, where do you see the housing market heading over the next 12 months? Look, I'd have to say I don't see 30% coming off of housing. Uh, Australia-wide. Australia-wide, yeah. 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 Look, I, when we look at the demand, um, our vacancy rates are quite low in some areas. Mm. You know, um, we're going to see a temporary pause in migration. I think that's going to be, and that might affect housing a little bit and housing demand. Yes. Uh, but I think that's um, 30% is a big, big mm. call. And we mm. saw some doomsdayers mm. come out uh, after the uh, GFC. Yep. Um, I think 18 months ago, I can't remember what it was. It was on 60 Minutes that our friends put a presentation mm. on there about mm. bricks and slaughter, how the market was about to uh, implode. All over, yeah. And um, they got it wrong. Yeah. Uh, and even now we're starting to see a return in the Sydney and Melbourne markets mm. uh, are bouncing back. So Melbourne had a, um, you know, a fairly, and Sydney, they both followed, sort of peaked, and you thought, okay, they're going to be in doldrums for quite a while, but mm. they had a fairly quick return to that rising market. Mm. Um, as Nick and I have discussed previously, whether that's going to be a sustained growth mm. on mm. that market. But look, there might be a bit of a bump. Um, that might open up some opportunities for um, property purchasers and investors mm. to you know, put a bit of a squeeze on on pricing. But mm. um, I think if we were in a market where there wasn't much demand and mm. people weren't wanting to buy houses and we were seeing people handbrake on completely, then I think housing prices would come off. Mm. So, you know, I guess um, everyone talks about timing of the market and everyone wants to pick the perfect time because, um, you know, that's what, what we try and do. It, you know, at the moment, you know, is as good a time as any to be starting to look at this area or uh, how do you view the timing at the moment? Um, I guess it gets back to that analogy of um, when should you have planted, when's the best time to plant a tree? Yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, that's right. So if your 20 years ago is now, mm. if you start now in 20 years' time, it's going to be that 20 years ago. Mm. And whether we look back at, you know, GFC, 9-11, COVID, all these forks in the road that have popped up. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, after the GFC, uh, I was doing some small property development and I got cold feet and was like, oh, I don't know. My business partner at the time, he continued. Mm. He was like, no, I've got to keep going. You know, I need to keep, you know, keep doing this. Mm-hmm. 
uh, he's gone ahead leaps and bounds mm. just through continuing. So mm. I'm not saying go out there and take high risks. Mm. You need to make calculated risks. Yes. And at the moment, you need to get the right advice. That's never been more um, important than right now to get the right advice on what to buy, where to buy, mm. how to buy. Mm. Um, but you can minimise your risks there. And also, funding's never been cheaper. No. I mean, we look at the uh, interest rates on a residential mm. investment loan at the moment have never been lower. Yes. We couple that with uh, an area with high rent yields mm. or strong rent yields, um, very high rental demand. Mm. We're minimising that risk. You know, mm. we push through this cycle uh, and you're already in the market when the next cycle's starting. And how do we know when prices have gone up or going up? When they've gone up. <laughs> And if you're in the market already, you've experienced some good happy days. After the fact. Um, one of the questions we had asked by one of our clients, is it possible to just do the advertising, inspecting and letting of a residential property as a standalone cost and not have the rest of the property managed by the property management business? So can you separate the functions? Yeah, look, you can contract a or contract a rental manager to do whatever you want and mm -hmm. some will do small parts of it. Mm -hmm. I'll be brutally honest, I just see risk, risk, risk yeah. with that. By somebody taking on the, the the responsibility. Yeah, I've written an ebook actually. Um, five reasons why you should never self manage your own property. <laughs> and uh, you know the crux of that is you've you've got a licensed professional. Now you have to have a full real estate license to be a rental manager these days. Yeah. Um, so you've got some good depth of knowledge. Mm. You have to have the experience. Now you've got to know how to select the right tenant. You've got to know how to do your inspections properly. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do all that and your tenant does something wrong and there's a dispute when they leave. And you end up in um, in the commission, the court, whatever um, jurisdiction you're in. You've got to know how to represent yourself properly and how to do that. Now, you know, if you're not managing something properly um, and you do that wrong, you could lose money. Some insurance policies state that you have to be your property has to be managed by a licensed professional in order for that policy to be valid. Yeah. Okay. So, so you always say, be wary. And I'm not a rental manager. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I just see the risk involved in not using a professional there. Um, and that's why we you know, aspire um, Property Advisor Network go through the extent of yeah. due diligence they do on our partners yeah. just to make sure that they are top notch. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions we got was what is the average property management costing an owner and, and what should they expect to be charged if the residential property is managed by a real estate agent or other management service? So, do you have any ballpark figures with that? Oh, look, it varies between location. Uh, anywhere, you know, South Australia, anywhere between 6 and 8% plus GST. Mm -hmm. um, some places do an all-inclusive rental management where you might pay a higher price, but they don't actually charge for inspections, uh, incoming uh, tenancies, and that the like of that. Mm. So, again, you know, you might see people that advertise 5.5% or 4% and you go, wow, that's amazing. Mm. They'll pack in all these little costs in the background. Yeah. How they also supplement that is they have a massive, what we call a massive rent roll. Mm. So each individual manager looks after a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. Now, they're too stretched to really service you properly Yes, if you're one of those people. So for the extra 15, whatever it dollars cost you a week to have a quality rental manager, it's worth it. It's tax deductible mm -hmm. and they are securing and you know, looking after your investment. And it's a big investment. Yeah. And you see how passionate I'm getting about this topic. <laughs> No, I agreed. I, I guess I um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you both, have you got any parting comments on the current, uh, any tips and tricks or anything for people out there looking to get into residential property? I, Nick, I'll hand over to you for any any parting words on, on this area. Um, look, my pearl of wisdom would be know your numbers. Know what the property is going to cost you once you've got it all financed. Uh, the actual cost of a property in the investment world is – not the price tag that you pay for it, not the mortgage you take out, but what that property is going to cost you or return you week in, week out, mm. once everything is said and done. Mm. If you know that figure, it helps you budget that much more effectively, that you can then hold the property through one cycle, two cycles or beyond mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that you're allowing time for that capital growth to occur. Yep. No, I appreciate that. It's uh, good advice. Uh, Adam? Um I'll say uh, get the right research done. So I find when a lot of clients come to me, oh, I've been researching an area, researching an area. Mm -hmm. What that means is they've been on realestate.com looking at pictures of property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't, uh, it sounds a bit rude, but that doesn't constitute research. Mm -hmm. So uh, access services, you know, that can look at the demographics of an area, what's making an area tick, you know, how many rental properties there are at the moment. Again, you don't want to be competing against 
other landlords to get that to uh, fixed pool of tenants. Yes. So have a look at getting the right research done and the right property yep. with a strategy in place. Because just buying a property because you know you need to buy a property and just buying one thinking, I'll just get that, mm -hmm. it's not quite right. No, no, it's so, good advice as well. Now, I understand you've written another ebook, Adam. What's what's your latest instalment? Yeah, um, I've just looked at the current COVID crisis. Um, I'm getting a lot of people coming to me going, what do I do with this? Do, do I keep investing, don't I? Personally, I'll be looking to sign a, um, a contract on um, building an investment property in the next week or two. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm pushing ahead. So I'm just looking at some reasons, you know, some just tips to invest in the current climate. Now, how do I so, get a copy of that ebook? So, yeah, we can arrange that. Um, if any of your clients want to get a copy of it, yep. they can get in touch with me. I can We can direct them to the uh, landing page. They can um, yep. just sign up and get a copy of that. So should be available next week, early sometime and next week. And do you week. want to give out details of that landing page? Uh, it hasn't been created at the moment, mate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll let everybody know. Yeah, so uh, if they get in touch with you, yeah, we can uh, make we'll the arrangements the right in there. Page. Excellent. Look, great to have you both in today. I've really appreciated you spending some time with us and, and the clients talking about the market. It's, it is certainly an interesting market and who knows what, uh, what the world holds for us next. Um, and hopefully we get some better news on, a, on all economic and health fronts just around the corner. So um, uh, we'll no doubt speak again at some stage down the track and uh, good luck everybody with their property investing. Right. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, guys.